our scripture lesson this morning is taken from 1 John. It is chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Yes. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Here ends the reading of his holy word. So you will no doubt notice in your bulletins and on the screen today that the uh, title of our sermon uh, is or was supposed to be, Can We Be Pure? Well, I have to tell you that I decided a little bit later in this week that I wanted to change what my sermon would be about. Um, it doesn't happen often. We tend to try to keep things around a central theme each Sunday, uh, but this week uh, something was on my heart that I felt we needed to discuss. So, uh, if you are the sort of person that hates it when a question gets asked and then not answered, I'm going to go ahead and answer the question for you this morning uh, very quickly uh, of can we be pure? Well, we can be, but it is only through the blood of Jesus Christ that we can be pure. Otherwise, it would be impossible. So there you go. That is the answer to the question. You can sleep easily at night if you were wondering what the answer would be. So I decided to change what the sermon was going to be about this week because I had a lingering thought that I just couldn't shake from last week's sermon. And I know that you guys all thought about last week's sermon very hard throughout the week, right? And, and really pondered it. So you're probably in the same boat that I was. Um, so I just, I couldn't, uh, every time I sat down to write what my original sermon idea was, I just couldn't shake this question or thought that was sticking in my brain from this last week. Uh, does anyone else ever get like that? You get stuck on uh, something and you just have to see it through or it'll never go away in your mind. Um, uh, if you do, you probably understand. So as I was working this week, the thought that kept running through my mind uh, from the sermon last week deals with the idea of giving our testimony. Now you may or may not remember last week I discussed how we as Christians should be willing and ready to give our testimony whenever the time comes. So as I thought about it this week, I realized that in my four years as the pastor here, I don't believe I've ever really given you my own testimony. So today I would like to take a bit of time and talk about what a testimony is, and then hopefully you will allow me to share mine with you. And I think the best place to start is to just talk about what a testimony is. You see, testimony is a word that is a church word. Um, it gets thrown around from time to time. And it is one that maybe not everyone is familiar with. A testimony is the story of how a person came to believe in God or has experienced God's presence and power in their life. And the children gave us some great examples this morning of that. Next, I want to tell you why uh, a quick reason why I haven't given my testimony from the pulpit uh, in my time here as the pastor. Um, the main reason is uh, when I'm up here, 
It, it's not about me. Now, I tell stories from my life from time to time, but they are always just to illustrate the point that I'm trying to make. And I use those stories because, just as Jesus used stories to teach people, I try to do that as well. So as I thought about my own testimony this week, I came to the realization that my faith journey started at a very young age. The first times I can remember hearing about God and Jesus uh, was from my great-grandmother. When I was a small child, my great-grandmother would watch me. Uh, she was always in the same nursing home that my mom was working at. So I got to go to the nursing home and I would go and stay with my great-grandmother. And I can remember her teaching me the songs like This Little Light of Mine and uh, Jesus Loves Me and all those things. And that is the first time I can remember hearing about Jesus. Now, as I grew a bit older, my parents were faithful in taking me to church or if they had to work on a given Sunday, they were faithful in making sure someone else took me to church on those days. And so I was in church on Sundays and uh, Wednesdays usually as well. I learned about the love that God has for me from wonderful Sunday school teachers. And I count myself blessed that I had them in my life and that they were willing to give of their time and their patience to teach me. Now I know that it couldn't have been easy for them. See, in the church that I went to growing up, I had uh, three uh, uh, boy cousins that also went to that church. And they were one year younger than me, three years younger than me, and five years younger than me. And outside of church, we did almost everything together as well. So when we were inside church, uh, we could be a bit of a handful when we were all together. So when we would do things like uh, sing songs like Deep and Wide, and we would do the hand motions, you know, deep and wide. Whenever we would go to the wide part, uh, my cousins, would all, we would all make sure we were standing right next to each other. And when we came to the wide part, we would go deep and wide and try to hit each other as hard as we could. Uh, so that is what our uh, Sunday school teachers were dealing with with the four of us. We had a tendency to cause little issues from time to time. Uh, when we moved to Pennsylvania uh, at the age of 14, uh, I was blessed to get to attend two different churches. Uh, I went to one church with my parents, and I went to another church uh, for youth group because the, the church with my parents, I was the youngest member, uh, and the next youngest member was my mother. So there wasn't much of a youth group to be had. And in that church that I went to with my parents, I was lucky to have uh, an adopted set of grandparents that took me in as if I was their own grandchild uh, and, and taught me again about the love of Jesus. In the church that I went to for youth group, I had a youth pastor that took the time to help me adjust from that move from Oklahoma. And I know he encouraged some of the other kids in that youth group to reach out to me and make me feel more at home. The first summer that we were in Pennsylvania, uh, that youth pastor and a few other adults took our youth group to Alabama to help rebuild homes for tornado victims. And I have to tell you that while I was in Alabama, I seriously considered running away back to Oklahoma. I figured that was the closest I was going to get on my own, and I might as well make a run for it. Now, the youth pastor must have known that something was up because he made sure to keep an eye on me. And if he couldn't watch me, he made sure to make sure someone else was watching me. In that time in my life, I learned what it meant to love others as we would love ourselves. Those people showed me that I had a place in a new state and the love of God that they shared with me helped me at a time in my life that was very hard. As I grew into my college years, I will be honest with you here, I went a little bit wild, a little bit wild there. I never stopped believing in God, but I was not making very good decisions in my life. Yet in those times, I could still feel the love of God. I knew what I was doing was wrong, 
I knew I was making choices that he wasn't going to like, but I still knew that he loved me all the same. After I graduated from college, I spent six months uh, teaching and living on my own in Spring Grove, which is down around York. I was two hours away from anyone that I knew, and it was the loneliest time in my life. After about two weeks of living on my own and teaching, I called my father crying one evening, and I mean bawling, crying, sobbing, that I couldn't do it and I wanted to come home. I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, teenagers can be really mean, especially if you're a long-term substitute teacher and you're just out of college, and uh, they would refer to you as fresh meat, and they were right. So I had a, a very difficult time, uh, and I felt as if I was a failure because I had spent four years working to become a teacher, and in my first job, I felt as if I couldn't do anything right. Now, after I had talked to my father that evening, he put my mom on, and she suggested that I find a church to attend. And I did that week, and the people of that little church, again, took me in as one of their own. And I think they could see how lonely I was. And before I knew it, I was enrolled in a young adult Bible study and going to church again. Again, I felt the love that God has uh, for me through the people that loved him. Uh, I wish I had remembered to tell them goodbye and thank you before I left. When our first child was born, Carlin suggested to me that we find a church to go to. And I said, where? And she said, well, why not Mount Pleasant? And this was a topic of discussion for the two of us because, as many of you know, I was not raised in the Methodist Church, and obviously Carlin was, but we agreed that we would go to Mount Pleasant. And wouldn't you know it, people again showed me God's love. When I decided that I was finally going to answer the call into ministry in my mid-30s, which, by the way, that calling had started in my teenage years, I had a lot of questions that needed to be answered. Questions like, where are we gonna end up? I have a really good job right now. Can we afford, if, afford to leave it? And am I actually able to do the work of ministry? Well, you guys know the answer to the first question, right? I ended up right here, right where I started. The second one, I have a good job, can we afford to leave it, was taken on faith that God will provide, and he has. And the third one, can I do the work? Well, the jury is still out on that one, but I will continue to try my best. Now, that is my testimony, and I will tell you that it does not seem to be a very remarkable testimony. There is no Saul on the road to Damascus conversion in my story. It seems like a very tame testimony. And when I think about it and the great stories of people that I know personally that have struggled with drugs and alcohol and the way they were able to leave behind those problems and find peace in God, when I stack my story up against theirs, it is not very dramatic. But... It is true, and my testimony is remarkable in its own way. Now, you would have needed to read between the lines here a bit to catch this, but statistically, I should not be following God. I am of a generation that people say never goes to church. I am of a generation where th this generation says, I'm spiritual but not religious. I went to college, and I know you all have heard the stories about how kids go to college and stop believing in God. And I know some of you might be experiencing that right now. And I know that some of you might be fearing that will happen in the future. But I want you to know that God will not abandon your children. And I want you to know that there is hope that they will return to him. 
I know it's hard to see that when you're in the midst of dealing with it, but I do know that it is true. See, my testimony, though it is not some great conversion story, it is a story of how God loves us. It is a story of how the love of godly people can help pull us through difficult times in our lives. I thank God for his never-ending love and the love of his people. My challenge for you this week is this. Think about your own testimony and maybe even share it with someone this week. Amen. Amen.